It is true that some preach Christ out of envy, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, that I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether in life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Well, welcome. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are honored that you've chosen to start your week off by worshiping with us here at Prescott Christian Church. Uh, for those of you who are on campus today, uh, we are so glad to have you with us in the room worshiping together. If you're a newcomer with us, uh, I would love the opportunity to say hi to you out in the lobby off to the right. We have a place we call Pastor's Point, and I'll be hanging out there at the end of the service. We'd love for you to come by and introduce yourself. And I want to welcome all of those who are tuning in on the online campus. So great grateful to have you as a part of the PCC family. From whenever and wherever you are, uh, shout out to Tim, uh, who's watching right now uh, in Seattle today. So uh, God's blessing on you up in Seattle. And also for those of you who are in the cafe, I saw there were several of you out there hanging out today. So shout out to you guys as well. So, gr- so glad to have you with us uh, this morning. Well, we are continuing a series that we started last week that we're calling To Live is Christ. And so we're working our way through the book of the Bible we call Philippians. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. Turn them on or turn them to Philippians chapter 1. That's where we're, going to, where we're going to be today. Uh, I do want to remind you that we have a resource that goes along with this series, a notebook that has information uh, for life groups and questions that you can dive deeper It also has daily engagement points for you, whether it's worship, whether it's memorizing the word, whether it's uh, uh, reflective questions for your family. So there's lots of ways to engage through this. So we passed them out last week. If you were not here to grab one of those, if you want one, just raise your hand right now wherever you are. Don't be shy. Keep them up. We've got some ushers who will walk around and hand those out. I would encourage you to utilize these. If you didn't get one last week, grab one today. Uh, Again, the goal of this series is not just to come here and consume some information. We want you to be in the Word for yourself each and every day, and this is one tool that we've provided for you to help you to do that. Again, for those of you who are online, uh, there is a PDF version of this on our website, the front page of the website, so you can go grab that for yourself uh, and have this to work alongside us throughout this series. So today we're in Philippians chapter 1. And so I do need to back up and just remind us of a little bit of the context. This was, the book of Philippians is actually a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the ecclesia, the gathering of God's people in the city of Philippi. So Philippi is a city in what we would call northern Greece. It is the first church plant that we know of in Europe. So again, for those of us from European descent, this should matter to us. This was the first church plant in Europe. And Paul had received this vision from God to go to Macedonia, which is what they called Europe at the time. Go to Macedonia and, and, and share the gospel there. And he shows up and he meets a group of women and he shares the gospel with them. One of them being a lady named Lydia, who the text says God opened her heart to hear God's or hear Paul's message and she responded that moment by being baptized in the river. A couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks later, Paul's sharing the gospel going around, his heading back to the place of prayer and a woman is following him who was possessed by a demon, but this demon had some special gifts, helped her to be able to tell the future. 
which made her owners really rich. And Paul finally got so annoyed, he turns around, casts out the demon, which gets Paul in a lot of trouble because when the demon's gone, all the owner's money making abilities go with the demon. And so they're upset and they drag Paul before the magistrates. Paul and Silas get stripped and beaten and jailed in Philippi. Bloody, in stocks, abused, beaten, in the dungeon. They began singing and praying to the Lord. You remember the rest of the story. An earthquake comes, opens all the doors of the jail. Their shackles fall off. The jailer, the Philippian jailer, is ready to take his own life because he's afraid that the, the prisoners have escaped. And Paul says, no, 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 we didn't come to so that your life could be taken. We came to give you life. And he shares the gospel. And that very night, the jailer and his whole household hear the gospel, believe it, and again are baptized in that moment. And the church in Philippi is born. It's been about 10 years since those events happened that Paul writes this letter back to these people. And they are, they've become ardent supporters of Paul and his ministry. They love him, and it shows because for 10 years, they've, they're always keeping tabs on him. They're always sending him money. They're always asking, how can we help? They're always making sure that he's doing okay. In fact, this letter that we have here in Philippians is actually a thank you note. Part of the reason he wrote this was to thank the people of Philippi for their support for the last decade and sending people and sending money to take care of him. He loves these people. This is a letter that, that was read to this church and it wasn't written to them to address any kind of problems or any kind of theological rebukes. No, this is, this is a letter of affection and thanksgiving because Paul loves these people in Philippi so much. And my hope is that as we read these letters, this letter to these people, that we witness this kind of relational love and affection between these people and Paul, that it would inspire us to begin to invest in the relationships in this ecclesia with that same type of love and affection for one another. So let's pick it up. We're going to pick up where we left off last week, which is first, I'm sorry, Philippians 1, chapter Chapter 1, verse 3. Here we go. I thank my God every time I remember you. This is how Paul begins this letter. And as we learned last week, again, Paul remembers them. He remembers them. And not remembers them in some kind of vague way. He remembers them. He He has a very personal relationship with these people. He stayed at Lydia's house for weeks, maybe months. He stayed with her. She fed him and took care of him. He remembers the Philippian jailer. No doubt, whenever Paul takes a bath and sponges off his shoulders, there are scars on his back that this jailer put there. He remembers these people. He remembers baptizing this jailer and his family, Lydia and her family. He remembers them. So so he remembers. And what does he do when he remembers? He says, I thank God for you. I thank God. Every time I remember, I thank God for you. And over the next few verses, we're going to read this kind of flowery, ooey-gooey introduction to this letter. But what's intriguing to me in this introduction is that nowhere in it does Paul thank the Philippians. He never says, oh, I thank you so much. He doesn't do that. Instead, as we see right here, He says, whenever I remember you, I thank God for you. I thank God for you. Paul recognizes that the Philippian people are a gift to him. But it is God who is the gift giver. And so he gives credit where credit is due. I thank God for you. Here's made me think of this. How many of you have somebody in your life that whenever they come to mind, you think, man, I am so grateful to God for these people, for this person. I thank God that he put this person in my life. Is there anyone who's who's 
Because of their connection to Christ and their connection to you, it makes you give gratitude, give thanks to God for them. Maybe it was the person who brought you to faith, and and whenever you think about them, you think, oh, I'm so grateful to God for them. Maybe it was somebody who helped you through a very difficult season of your life. Maybe it was somebody who took you under their wing. You've been following Jesus for a long time, but somebody came alongside and helped you take some next steps you didn't even know you needed to take. Maybe it was somebody, and they're not in your life every day, but you know if you asked, they would be in your life any day. They would just show up because they love you and they love Jesus. And you think about them and when when your heart explodes, you say, I'm so grateful to God for them. Do you have a relationship like that? Are you that for somebody else? That when they think of you and your investment into them, they say, man, I'm so grateful to God for them. Who do you need to thank God for? Now, although he doesn't thank them It is interesting to me that he does write them and tell them, I thank God for you. And my guess is that that was a huge encouragement to them. That as they heard that, hey, I just need you to know whenever I think about you, I'm so grateful to God for you. He didn't thank them, but he let them know that he thanked God for them. And I can't help but think that today there's somebody in your life who needs to hear, I thank God for you. Every time I think of you and what you've done for me, my heart just goes out in gratitude to God for you. Who do you need to text right now to let them know that you're grateful to God for them? That's how he begins. Let's keep going. In all of my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So why is Paul so grateful for these people? Because of their partnership in the gospel from the first day until he's writing this letter. And again, Paul wrote this about 10 years after he showed up in Philippi for the first time. And from the beginning, from the, from the first day, Lydia, this Philippian jailer, their families, they all started this church and they started sharing the gospel. And for a decade, they've been supporting Paul wherever he goes. Paul says, you have been my partners in this calling of growing the kingdom. You're my partners in this. In other words, they were not consumers. They were contributors from the very beginning. They were contributors. They didn't just show up to receive things from Paul. They showed up to be invested in the thing with Paul. They were partners with him. They they weren't like a lot of American Christians who go to church to sit and get. Right? Just sit and get. I just show up and I'm going to take up a seat and I'm just going to get whatever it is got to give me today. Sit and get. That's, they, they were not in that category. They were partners in this. They knew that they had a role to play with Paul in sharing the gospel. They were to give and to serve and to sacrifice. They had a part to play. They were partners in the gospel, not just partakers of the gospel. And there's a huge difference. And it was because of this, because of their willingness to roll up their sleeves and to partner in the gospel with Paul. Paul says, I thank God for you. And when I pray, oh man, I always pray with joy. When I pray for you, there's never any sadness. There's never any frustration. There's never any uh, uh, disillusionment. There's never any worry. Oh, I just pray from a place of joy. Because of how you guys, from the first day, you've jumped in as a partner and you haven't stopped. Which tells us something. It tells us something. Like if you're just beginning your journey with Jesus, like you're on the front end, like from the first day, you're just now starting this thing. Here's what you need to know. You can be a partner in the gospel from the first day. Like, you don't have to wait until you know more. You don't have to wait until you've experienced more. You don't have to wait until you've been, become more mature to contribute to the mission of growing the kingdom of God. You don't have to do that. Paul says, you've you've been my partners in this from the first day. Lydia, you jumped in. You got out of the baptistry into the ministry. You've been in this thing from the beginning. And so if you're just starting this journey with Jesus, 
You don't have to wait. You can start now. You have a role to play. Now, my guess is for most of you in the room, you're kind of on the other end of the spectrum. It's been a long time since the first day for many of you. Like you got 20 years, 30 years, 50 years for some of you that you've been following Jesus. And so I, I want to speak to the other end of the spectrum here for a second. There is no expiration date on your partnership in the gospel. Like there's no retirement plan in the kingdom of God. You know that, right? It says, look, you were there from the first day and you're still there. You're still in this. You're still giving and serving and partnering with the gospel. There is no retirement in the kingdom of God. And I know for some of you, you, you like counting, you're counting down to the day you get to retire. Like you got it, it's on a calendar. You got four more years, I'll be 64. I can get 70% of my, whatever. You got it like down, you got the math done. You are ready to finish this thing. Some of you, that's a little in the rear view. Like you did that and you're, you loved the day that you got to walk out and quit. You were done you're just counting it down till I can get my social security check and be done. You just can't wait. And that's fine for your career. But it is unacceptable for your calling. It is fine to retire from your career. It is unacceptable for your calling to be a partner in the kingdom of God. We all have a role to play to see the kingdom advance. We all have a role to play in multiplying disciples. Whether you're on the front end or the back end, it doesn't matter. If you're breathing, you still have a part to play. We are partners in this, not just partakers of this. And the people of Philippi, they got it. Which is why Paul says, I am so grateful for them. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I want to have a moment of honest confession here today. This is a safe place. Let's have a moment of honest confession here. How many of you have ever wondered or worried or doubted if you were going to, the, to make it to the finish line of your faith? Anybody ever worry that you're going to make it to the end? Yeah, go ahead and raise them up. I want to let this encourage you. You're not alone. Look around today. And, and let me just say for those of you who raise your hand, I think it's wise, and I'll share with you why. There's a phenomenon that is happening in church world right now. And my guess is that it's always happened, but with the advancement of social media, it just becomes more public as people's platforms get bigger. There's this phenomenon where Christians are deconstructing their faith. Deconstructing meaning they are taking their faith and what they've learned and what they've believed and they've taking it apart piece by piece. I picture a Lego model, just piece by piece deconstructing their faith. And in many ways, that's a healthy thing to do. The problem is with many of these people, they are not reconstructing their faith. They're just taking it apart piece by piece and then they are walking away, leaving their faith in a pile of debris behind them. And it isn't just the everyday, ordinary follower of Jesus. There are many pastors and church leaders who have been preaching faithfully the gospel for decades, who are deconstructing their faith and they are leaving it behind. And every time I see it happen to another pastor, or another leader, or another person with a platform, there's something in me that wonders, could that happen to me? Is this going to be my story in the end? And again, I think it's a right thing to ask ourselves. Because the scriptures give us plenty of warnings Plenty of warnings against thinking that would never happen to me. 
And I just want to share a few of them with you today. And I'll just, I'll just talk about the Apostle Paul, who writes this great promise that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. He writes this great promise. And yet this same Paul writes these warnings. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, Paul says, I do not run like someone running aimlessly, and I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. What is Paul saying here? He's saying that getting to the finish line of faith is going to take some work. There's a lot of people who finish, I'm sorry, who start the race, who don't finish the race, who miss out on the prize at the end. And Paul says, what we have to do is we got to start this race, but if we're going to finish it, it's going to take strict training. It's going to take some work to get to the end of this thing. It's going to take me striking a blow to my body. Actually, it's going to take me making my body my slave. In other words, I make my body do things it doesn't want to do. I make my body do things that aren't natural. I make it do what I want it to, not what it wants to do. I have to do that. Why? So that... So that, Paul, speaking for himself, so that after I've preached to others, I won't be disqualified. Paul himself is wondering, is there a chance that I will have shared and preached and planted churches and led people to Jesus and I get to the race and I don't get the prize? Paul's worried about that. So he says, I go into strict training and I beat my body to make it obey so that when I preach to others, I don't get disqualified myself. And this is not the only time Paul talks like this. He's writing to a young pastor named Timothy and here's what he says to Timothy. His coaching of this pastor, he says, Timothy, watch your life and your doctrine closely and persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Which the inference to this is, but if you don't, watch your life and your doctrine closely. If you don't, persevere in them. You won't save yourself or your hearers. Again, this is, this is scary. This is Paul. Paul commands Timothy, watch your life and your doctrine. Watch your behaviors and your beliefs. Your life, your doctrine. Watch what you do. Watch what you believe. Watch them closely and persevere in them. Why do you have to persevere? The only reason you've ever had to persevere is because you've done or doing something hard. There's no reason to persevere when things are easy. You persevere because something's hard. You persevere only in times where everything in you wants to quit. That's why perseverance exists. There would be no need for perseverance if you never wanted to quit. Paul says to Timothy, persevere in them. Persevere in them. This right here, this is what I'm afraid so many Christians have missed. Those who are deconstructing. This is what I believe so many leaders have failed to do. Is to heed this warning right here. They have have failed to watch their life, their behaviors, and watch their beliefs. They haven't clung to those and persevered in them. Instead of hanging on tightly to them, they've hung on to them loosely. And in hanging on to them loosely... Their behaviors begin to change and their behaviors don't match with their beliefs. And there's this dis- disconnect between what I believe and how I behave. And so something's got to give. 
And the faith that they started with simply slips away. And in doing so, in losing their own faith, so many who followed them continue to follow them right away from Christ Jesus. And again, this isn't the only time. This isn't new. Paul says it happened in his day. Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well. You're going to have to fight for your faith. Paul says to Timothy, you're going to have to fight for it. It's not going to stay easy. If you just pick up your feet and coast along and think you're going to get to the end, you're not. You have to fight for it, Timothy. You need to fight the battle well, holding on to the faith and a good conscience. Because when there is a, when, when these two things do not align, when what you say you believe does not match with what you do, you will end up searing your conscience. And when you sear your conscience, you'll lose your faith. By recalling them, you may fight the battle well, holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to their faith. I said lose your faith. That's the wrong terminology. It's not biblical. You don't lose your faith. No one has ever lost their faith. It's... Your faith is not like your sunglasses, right? Where you put them down and you don't know where they are. I just had them. They were here 15 minutes ago. I've lost my sunglasses. Your faith isn't like that. It's not what happens. But what happens is you got your faith, you got your conscience, and when your life does not match what you say you believe, you end up searing your conscience and something has to give. And what most often gives is I let my beliefs follow my behaviors. And in doing so, I have to reject my faith. This doesn't happen accidentally. No one gets into the kingdom accidentally, and nobody goes out of the kingdom accidentally. It's a decision going in. It's a decision coming out where you have rejected your faith. You've rejected it. So having shipwrecked, come, I'm sorry, having suffered shipwreck in regard to your faith. That's the warning that Paul has. So for those of you who raised your hand and said, yeah, I've worried about that. I've wondered, is this possible for me? I think you are right to ask that question. It's a wise thing to do. So what confidence can we have? How do we know that we're moving in the right direction? How do we make sure that we are on the path to getting to the finish line? I think our text in Philippians 1 helps us in this. Go back to Philippians 1, 6. Here's the great promise. Look what he says. Being confident of this so that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You want to know if you're moving in the right direction? There's two things he says in this text that I think can help us. One is, do you have a beginning point of your faith? Can you look back and say, yeah, yeah, Jesus began something in me. I know the time. I know the date. I know the season. I can remember the camp. I remember. I'm confident. These people, Paul says, I'm confident that this is what's going to be your story. How does he have that kind of confidence? Because he can pinpoint, he can look back, he can think about when their faith started. He can think about Lydia at the river, the jailer in that night when he's baptizing his family. There was a starting point, a beginning point to their faith. It wasn't just something they were born into. It wasn't just something they inherited from their family. They didn't just call themselves a Christian their whole life, but there was a moment that they can point to. Oh no, I was dead and Jesus made me alive. Do you have that? Do you have a beginning point where you can say, yeah, Jesus started something in me. I'm not hanging on to my family faith. I'm not here because my granddaddy was a preacher and his daddy was a preacher. My uncle's a preacher. No, no, no. It's not, this this isn't some kind of uh, inheritance that gets passed down. No, no, no. Jesus started something in me. And then he goes, 
Then it goes to the other end, the second part. And I think this may be even more important. That it wasn't that Jesus just started something. It's that Jesus is carrying it on. There's something still happening in my life. It wasn't that Jesus just began something. It's Jesus is carrying something on. He is carrying it to completion. Philippians 1.6. This is not just about Jesus is going to make me perfect one day when glory comes on the last day. This is about Jesus is making me perfect every day. He's transforming me every day. This isn't just about what happened way back then when you came to faith. This is not about what's going to happen one day when Jesus comes back. But it's about what's happening right now in the in-between. Do you have doubts and worries and fears that you're going to make it to the end? Then ask yourself this. Are you being changed now? Are you being transformed now? Do you see Christ at work in you now? I mean, if you are banking on the fact that you prayed a prayer when you were nine, if your faith, if all you're holding on to is I got baptized in junior high with all of my girlfriends on the last night when we were all crying, if you're banking on the fact that I went through confirmation with when I was 12, and so now I'm good forever. That kind of faith has no handles. And it's easy for that kind of faith just to slip right through your hands. If that's all you've got to hang on to, that's a pretty scary place to be. It is in a deepening faith, a growing love, a pursuing of holiness, day after day, month after month, year after year. It's that kind of transformation that Paul has seen in these people for a decade. He was there from the first day, and he's watched them for a decade. And it's that kind of confirmation of seeing them grow year after year, month after month, for a, for a decade. He has seen the transformation that Jesus has done in them. And that's why he says, I've watched your partnership of, in the gospel. And because of that, I am confident of this. That he who began a good work is going to finish it. Because I see him still at work in you. And in just a moment, we're going to see Paul pray for it to continue. Because, it, because that's where the confidence comes from. The confidence that we can have. It's not just that something got started or something will someday end. But even now in the midst of it, we see Christ at work in us. Paul says, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. Whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. I feel this way because you're with me. You're experiencing the grace. No matter where I go or what I do, you guys are always with me in this. When I'm preaching the gospel for the first time, where I'm in chains like I am when I'm writing this letter, you guys are in it with me. Paul says, I can have confidence that this is true for you because you have proven yourself faithful when it would have been easy for you to cut, cut bait and walk away. And then he adds this line. God can testify how I long, how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Oh, man, do you hear his pastoral heart? Paul writes this, and I want you to think about the affection of Christ. What's the affection of Christ look like? What did the affection of Christ lead Jesus to do? It's actually what sent him to the cross. It was out of his love, his affection that he said, I'll give up everything. I'll lay down my life. I will die for you, my affection for you. Is that great? And Paul says, as God is my witness, I'm not lying and I'm not exaggerating church in Philippi. I love you with the same affection that, that Jesus loved us. And I wonder, do we have that kind of affection for each other? Do you have that for the people sitting in front of you and behind you, 
for those in your life group today? Do you have that kind of affection that say, I, I love you, I would lay down my life and my rights for you. I don't think I can say that about you. But I want to. Just one more way that Jesus has some work to do in me. And all of this love and affection that Paul has for these people, it culminates in this prayer. This is my prayer. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. So that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Don't miss this. I want you to think about for a moment your prayers. Think about your prayer list. What makes it onto your prayer list? Think about the prayers that happen in your life group or your discipleship group or get shared on the text message thread or the the prayer uh, email that you're a part of. What makes the list? My guess is if your prayer list is like my prayer list, there's usually three things that are on the prayer list. One, it's about people who are sick or dying. We're praying for their health. It's Secondly, about people whose relationships are broken, whether it's a marriage in trouble or a child that is running off of the the path, so relationship. And lastly, it's about financial issues. I need a job. I'm about to lose my job. There's this financial thing that my house is going to be taken. So those are the three things that dominate our prayer list. Physical stuff, relational stuff, financial stuff. My guess is that's probably 95% of your prayers. I want you to know you don't find that in Scripture. Like, read this prayer. You can dig around in Scripture and find some of that stuff, and Jesus wants to hear it. He says, cast all your cares on me, but you will not find those top three anywhere in Scripture. They're not what's most important. They're not most prominent. I want you to hear what Paul's praying for here. He's praying for their continued growth, the continued transformation. Why? Because it is in that continuing transformation that the promise of Philippians 1, 6 comes to pass. That he's going to finish what he starts because he's doing it now. Look at what he says. I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight. He prays, look, as you grow in your faith, as you gain more knowledge, as your insight deepens, here's my prayer, that your love grows because you learn more. Here's a question for you. As you learn more, as your insight deepens, does it make you love God and love people better? Because that often doesn't happen with people in the church. Oftentimes the ones who have the deepest insight and the greatest knowledge often have the coldest, deadest hearts. If your knowledge of Scripture, if your insight in the deep things of faith do not cause you to love God and people more, you're doing it wrong. Since my prayer is that your love deepens as your insight grows, that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. We don't have knowledge for knowledge's sakes. We have knowledge so that we know what to do, so you can discern the best actions to take. And in doing those best actions, you're actually going to become more holy, pure, and blameless. Does your insight make you look more like Jesus? Does your knowledge make you obey Jesus more? Are you more pure, more blameless today than you were a year ago? Five years ago? 25 minutes ago? And out of this growth in your obedience, you will be filled with a fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. It comes through Jesus. It is Jesus at work and in you that brings this about. You're not doing this on your own. There's a fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God, not to you. It's not your glory, not your praise. It's God's glory, God's praise, because God is at work in you. Not back then, not someday, in this moment right now. Paul says, I have confidence he's going to finish what he started because I see him working it now. And I'm praying it keeps happening. 
this is not what my prayers mostly look like. And my guess is it probably isn't what your prayers mostly look like. But it is today. Today, I want to end by praying this prayer over you. And so I'm going to ask if you want to receive that today, that you just stand where you are right now. (laughs) And I want to pray this as a benediction over us today. That we come to believe it and to receive it. For God to bring about this transformation that gives us the confidence, not in what has happened, not in what will happen. We have a confidence because we see what Jesus is doing in us right now. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight so that you may discern what is best. And be pure and blameless on the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness through Christ Jesus. To the glory and praise of God. If you receive it, say amen. Amen. See you next week.